Hey everyone, welcome to this tutorial. My name is Graham. I'm going to be going over the basics of programming in Lua for the audio system for Playdate. So for this tutorial, we're going to cover the basics of how to play sounds, music, how to create your own sound, how to use the microphone for the Playdate, and how to arrange that and do it within your Lua program. For this tutorial, I'm going to assume that you already know how to start a playdate, how to take inputs, how to do some general work in creating a new file with it. If you're not sure how to do that, I recommend watching this tutorial set by Squid God, where he goes over the basics of how to get a project started and what the basics are for creating files within a playdate. So the playdate itself has several audio outputs and inputs. There's a little speaker to play the audio out without a headphone jack. There's these three dots at the bottom that are a microphone input. And then there's a combined microphone headphone jack if you wanted to do a line in microphone or a line out headphone or a combined line in out headphone microphone combination. It'll detect that. And so this is what we're gonna target with all the different programming and functions that we're gonna use. So for this tutorial, start up a new file. Uh, I'm going to use the template that's used with most of the Squid God. And you're going to need to import these different MIDI file and MP3 file and these two WAV files. You can find these on the GitHub page for this project, which I've linked to in the description. And just download them and make sure that they're included in the source file, and the same as your main.lua file. So in your new file, we're going to be using the graphics core library. And then I've just added a variable called PD for Playdate just to save time and GFX for the PD.graphics also to save time. So the first type of audio function we're going to use is a file player. This is typically used for larger files like music, something where it's going to be playing for a long time and you're going to want to be reading it off of the disk. So you don't want to be using too much memory to store and play the play the file. You want it to mostly just sit on disk. So to do that, we're going to make a new variable for this file player. Uh, we're going to call it music player. And it is going to be a new file player. So we're going to say equals new or equals pd dot sound dot new no equals pd dot sound dot file player dot new and we can pass in with the new we can pass in what file we want it to play so we can say mp3 music dot mp3 and so now when the program starts it'll load this file into memory ready to play so now we want to be able to trigger this so let's say when we push the a button we want it to start playing music. So trigger music with a button. So if pd dot button is just pressed, uh, and the button we want to check for is k button a. So when the a button is just pressed, we want music player to play. So music player colon play with brackets. And when we run this and we push the A button, you can hear the music starts and it plays through one time and then it stops. So what we want here, just for visual reference, I'm going to add some visuals. Uh, and so I just want a little icon in the middle that is a stop icon when the music is stopped and a play button when the music is playing. So I want to know if music player colon is playing. So this just returns true false whether the music player is active and playing music. So if it is playing, I want, first we're going to clear the graphics. And so if it is playing, I want it to draw a little triangle around that is about 20 pixels wide by the center. So 
graphics dot fill triangle and the three points I'm going to use are x of 190 with a y of uh, 110 and then an x of 210 with a y of 120 and then an x of 190 with a y of 220. So that's just going to draw a little triangle about 20 pixels wide around the middle uh, and if it's not playing, so otherwise, I want to draw a stop symbol. So graphics dot fill rect, and I want it at 190, 110, and I want it to be 20 pixels wide and 20 pixels high. So if I push the A button, Okay, this should have been 120. Oh no, sorry, this should have been 130. So now if I push this, it switches to a triangle while the music is playing. It switches back to a stop button when it stops. Okay. Uh, so we want this to loop, and so the way that we get it to loop is in the play function, one of the arguments is the number of times that you want it to loop. So if we wanted to just play through exactly twice, you could put in two. If you wanted 100 times, you could put in 100. Or if you just wanted to start and keep looping forever until it receives a stop command, you can hit zero. So if we run this, it starts playing. And it loops and it keeps playing again. Now it's going to keep playing like this forever until we close the program. And so instead what we want is a way to get this to stop. So what I'm going to do is set up so that it will start playing when you push the A button down. I'm going to set it up so that it stops playing when you release the A button. So we'll say if pd.button is just released, pd.k button A, then music player stop. So now, push it, it starts playing, it loops through, and then if I release it, the music stops and it switches back to the stop. So there's a number of other things you can do with this. You can set it to cause a function when it stops, you can set it to some other stuff. What I'm going to do though is, just to demonstrate one of them, is that I'm going to set it so that it adjusts the rate of the music. And so what I want is that when you're pushing the up button, the music plays a little bit faster, and when you're holding the down button, the music is going to play a little bit slower. So let's say we're going to adjust music speed with up and down. So if p dot button is pressed, so if the button is being held, so pd and the button that we're going to use is pd k button up, then music player and the command is set rate and the input is a number that tells you how much faster or slower. So if we set it to one, it's going to play at the exact same speed. In this case, we're holding up, so we want it to play a bit faster. So we're going to say 1.5, so 50% faster. And we're going to say else if PD dot button is pressed and we're going to check for the down arrow K button PD dot K button down if that's pressed then music player set rate 0 0.5 so half as quickly and we want this to reset if none of them are being pushed so we're going to say else music player set rate one. So it should reset when we let go of the buttons. Let's try this out. So we push this, it starts playing it, and then if I hold up, it goes 50% faster. I let go, it goes back to normal. I can hold down, it slows way down. I can let go, it goes back to the same speed.
the last point I'll make for the file player is that when I was adding this, I was using an MP3 file. And so the file name I gave was the file name that you hear see, see here, mp3music.mp3. If I wanted to use a wave file instead, I'd probably type music.wave. But if I run this, you can see you get an error because for some reason it decided not to load music.wave. And this is a specific bug to Playdate at the moment at this time that if you give the .wave extension for a file player, it for some reason refuses to load it. And so instead, if you're trying to load a WAV file, you have to give the title as just the title of the WAV file without the .wave extension. So if we run this, it opens just fine. And then if I hold the A button, it plays the file, no problem. This is the, the same music file as I have for MP3. It's just a WAV version of that. So this may be fixed at a later date, but for now, if you're trying to use a WAV file, just make sure to know with file player that you have to just call it as music. So the next type of audio player that you can use is the sample player. So sample player is typically used for shorter audio like sound effects that you want it to play quickly and get out of memory. It's not as useful for music or longer files that you would want to play from file. So we're going to create a sound effect player here and we'll call it local sound effect player. And it's going to be a pd.sound dot sample player and we're going to initialize it by doing dot new and we're going to pass in the sound effect that we want it to play which is sound effect dot wave for the file player you can start it with no music file loaded and then as soon as you start your file or, or do an initialization, you can use file player load to add the file in. With sample player, you have to have a file when you initialize the sample player. So if I get rid of this and just make a new one without any file going in, you can see there's an error with sample player. It should be a new file or path with that. So we're gonna add it in here say sound effect dot wave and I'll put this one back to music and run this and now you see it runs just fine okay so now we want to play this sound effect that we've brought in so let's trigger it on the B button similar to how we did it for file player so we'll say trigger sound effect with B button and say if P dot button just pressed P dot K button B this time then sound effect player play and if P dot button just released pd.k button b then sound effect player stop all right let's try this so we'll run it and now if i hold this the b button down you can hear it plays through that sound and if i push it and let it go you can hear that it stops midway through playing this now i'm just going to update our stop play symbol so that it also does the sample player so it is the same syntax so we'll just add an or and so if sound effect player is playing then it's going to add a triangle and if not then it's going to draw the stop symbol so it functions Similarly to file player with some minor differences and some other functions that you can change. Uh, the only other function I'm going to show for now is that if you want a sound effect to play 
And once the sound effect is finished playing, you want it to run a specific piece of code. Then it has an um, a function called set set finish callback. So let's make a function here. So this is outside of our update now. So we're going to make a new function called finished playing sound effect. And all it's going to do is print to the console and say finished playing sound effect. And so the way we set this is not here, but down here for sound effect player. We'll say sound effect player set finish callback and pass in the argument or the function name that you want it to execute when it's finished playing, which is going to be finish playing sound effect. And there's no need to add the brackets. So now if I run this and I open the console and I push this, you can see when it finishes that it has executed this piece of code. And same thing if I stop it prematurely, every time it stops it plays this code. If we set this up so that it was looping, so if I, it's same syntax as for music player, I can add a zero here. And we play this, it should start looping as I hold this. But it only finishes and executes that when it actually comes to a stop. So when I let go of it. So in this case, when it loops through, it's not going to execute that code, only once the sound effect player has actually received the stop command. If you wanted to execute code every time you finish a loop, instead of finish callback, you would set the loop callback. And now every time it runs through a loop, it's going to call finish playing sound effect. And we should see something show up here. There you go. Every time it finishes the loop, it runs that section of code again. So the next function we're going to look at, for sound effect player, what we have done when we initialized it is we brought in a sound effect that we had recorded previously. But the Playdate also has a microphone on the bottom that allows you to record audio into the device and to store that. And so we're going to set up some code that will record a little clip of audio and it will load it into this sample player. And so the first thing we need to do is set this up so that it can store some audio and then load it. So what we're going to do is set it up so that the right button when you hold it will begin recording. When you let it go, it'll stop that recording and it'll automatically load that into our sound effect player. So let's start writing that here. So with an update, we want to trigger recording with right arrow. So we're going to say if pd dot button is just pressed and the button we want is p dot k button right, then we want to start recording. And if pd.button just released, pd.k button right, then we want to stop recording. Stop recording, and then we want it to stop recording and load recording into sound effect player. So to start recording, you need to have a sample for it to record into. So it can't just create a sample with the same function. You have to create a sample for it to record onto. So we're going to do that now. So we're going to say, make a new variable. We're going to call it buffer. And it's going to be a sample. So it's going to be pd.sound.sample.new. And when you create a sample, you need to specify the type of sample and how long it's going to be. And so how long it's going to be, for now we'll just say in seconds, just five seconds. And then the type of sample, these are the different types of samples. So there's two different bit rates 
and two different audio setups. One is mono and one is stereo. So mono is single track, uh, stereo is left and right. So your left and right headphone track. So typically music would be stereo and any vocal input would be mono. So in this case, because we were recording just from a single input microphone, we're gonna make this a mono. So this is going to be pd.sound.k 16 bit. No, k pd.sound.k format 16 bit mono. So now we have a variable called buffer. It is a five second empty sample with a 16 bit mono format. So now we want to start recording to that sample. So we can say pd.sound.micinput and we're gonna to wanna to use record to sample. And we want it to go to buffer, which we've already set up. And then we have to pass in a function for it to do once that's complete. So we're gonna make a new function down here. And the function is called finished recording microphone. And the only variable is gonna be the recording. So back up here, we have our buffer, and then we're gonna record to sample. We're gonna record to the buffer variable, and then we're gonna call finished recording microphone. And record to sample is automatically going to pass buffer or whatever sample we put in here into finished recording microphone as the, the main argument. So then down here in finished recording to microphone, what we wanna do, so once it's finished recording, we want it to load it into sound effect player so that we can hear it back. So in here, we're gonna say sound effect player set sample recording. So now the sound effect player will forget about sound effect.wave that we had loaded in before. And instead it's gonna load up the recording that we just made with the microphone input. And so up here, we also need it to stop recording if we let go of this. So we're just gonna say pd.sound.micinput.stop re recording. Okay, so now if we push the right arrow, it should start recording to buffer. If it gets to the end of this five seconds, it should automatically stop and load buffer into this function, which is gonna load it into the sound effect player so that we can play it back. Or if before that five seconds is up, we release the right button, then it's gonna automatically stop recording. Okay, so let's try it out. So I'm gonna hold the right button and do some inputs and let it go. And then we can push this button and do some inputs and let it go. Okay, so you heard that it played through and it started looping again because we have this set up to loop. Uh, and I'm just gonna adjust this so that it also shows a recording circle when this is playing. So we wanna know when this is recording. Now there's no, there's no simple function to just say mic input is recording. So we're gonna have to make our own Boolean. So up here, we're just gonna say local, make a new variable, call it is recording. And it's gonna be false by default. And so when we start recording, it's gonna be true. And when we're finished recording, it's going to be false. So then for our visuals, we are gonna say if is recording, then we wanna draw a circle. So we're gonna say graphics.draw fill circle at point, and that point is gonna be at 
200 and 120 and have a radius of 10 pixels. Let's get this out of there and this is going to be else if. Okay, so if it's recording, it's going to put up a circle. If not, then it's going to check for playing to do a triangle. And if none of those, then it's going to see that it stopped. So let's try this out. So load this playing the circle. I'm going to hold the right button. You can see that it switches to a circle because we're recording. If I keep holding it past the five seconds, it's automatically going to switch to a stop. Now I can let go of the right. Nothing changes because it already stopped recording. And we can try and play it back. You can see that it switches to a circle because we're recording. If I keep holding it past the five seconds, you can see that it switches to a circle because there you go. So you've recorded something from the microphone, it's stored it into a sample, and in this case we set it into a sample player so that we can play it back, but you could do whatever you wanted with that. Another neat function with the microphone input is that you can actually get the current level of microphone input in terms of how much, how many decibels or how, how much sound is coming in. And we can visualize that. So what we can do is if once we start recording, once we've activated the microphone, we can say pd.sound.micinput.start listening. And this will start actually measuring how much audio is coming in to the microphone. And when it stops, we can say pd.sound.micinput.stop listening. And it will stop. So if we want to visualize this, now within our visuals, visualize microphone level, we can say graphics dot fill rectangle and we'll locate it at x of 10 and a y of 200. We'll give it a width of 10 pixels and then the height is going to be pd dot sound dot mic input dot get level. And so this is going to return a value between zero and one, where one is completely peaking. Uh, it's the most input the microphone can handle and zero is totally quiet. And so for drawing our rectangle, we don't want to have a height of one pixel. So I'm just going to multiply this by 200. So now this will give us a little gauge and I'm going to make it negative so that it goes up, not down. This will give us a little gauge that shows how much microphone input we're good. We're inputting where 200 pixels high is the most and zero is no, none going in. So now if I run this again and I do the same recording, so you can see right now I'm talking and there's no gauge, but if I start to hold the right button, you can see that a little gauge pops up and that tells you, how much audio is coming in at one time and it stops once it stops and same thing this is going to play the see same that sample a little gauge pops up and that tells you how much audio is coming you so this can be useful just for visualizing if you're creating an audio microphone level in and you want to see how much is in there or you want to set up a function where it's triggered where the audio gets above a certain point just make sure that you start listening before you initialize this because it can only get this level when it's listening. So for everything that we've done so far, the music player, the microphone input, the sample player, these are based around music or audio files where you have recorded a WAV file or an MP3 file or you're recording it on the fly and it's storing it internally, but it's something that's pre-recorded or that you're recording. But for audio design or for making sound effects or for music, you may want to be able to create a sound within the game where it creates it basically as a synthesizer. And the company that makes Playdate, Teenage Engineering, has a range of different audio devices and synthesizers and handheld pocket operators that use different synthesizer code. And so they've included a whole bunch of functions and programming within Playdate that lets you access and utilize these to create your own sounds. So the first one that we're going to look at is the synth. So let's say you want to push a button and have it start playing a specific 
sound for a specific amount of time, you'll want to use a synth to generate that sound based on on the input of what frequency and how long and, and that you're activating it. So let's create a new variable. We're going to call it synth player, and it's going to be p.sound.synth.new. And we'll put in no arguments to start. And we'll say that we're going to trigger this with the left button. Let's say trigger synth with left arrow. So same code if pd dot button is just pressed, pd dot k button left, then synth player play. So in this case, if we tried to just use play, it wouldn't work because you have to pass in a specific note or frequency. So you can use play note and pass in a frequency, 261.2 hertz. Or you can do play MIDI note and pass in the name of a specific note on a keyboard. So in this case, we'll do B flat 3. So if we run this and we press left, should hear a note. Great. So it's playing, but it has no way to stop. And it's playing a B flat. So now we only want this to play while this button is being held. So let's also say if pd.button just released, pd.k button left. We're going to say synth player. Um, so we could use stop, and it would make the audio immediately stop. But what we want to do here is instead use note off. And this is going to become more useful when we start to get into the ADSR. But it instead of just completely stopping the audio, it's equivalent to pulling your finger up off of a piano key. And so it'll keep letting the note ring out a little bit if it's set up to have a release. So if we run this now, it should play the sound while we're pushing it and then stop playing it when we release it. Okay. So this is a, a general synth, but we want to be able to change what's involved with the synth and how it sounds. And that's where the synth function and some of the parts that go with it are extremely powerful in terms of sound design. So if I go back up to our synth, we said new with no, no inputs, but there is a whole bunch of different waveforms that you can use. So it defaults to using the sine wave, which is what you've heard, but there's actually a whole bunch of different waveforms that it will accept, uh, which I'm showing on the screen now is all the different ones that it can do, and each one has a different sound quality. I'm not going to cover what each of the different waveforms is doing in this tutorial because this isn't generally a synth and a sound design tutorial. But if you check out another synth tutorial, it'll sort of show you what the, the different properties of each of these are. But for this, we can say pd.sound.kwave square. So now if I run this, instead of the sine wave that we were using before, we should now hear a square wave. So a lot harsher with a different sound, and same if we do uh, sawtooth, we would get a different sound, or any of the ones that I showed on the screen. The other aspect to this is right now, if I run this, it's set up so that as soon as I push the note, it starts playing right away, and it keeps playing at maximum volume until I let go of the note, and as soon as I let go of the note, it immediately stops. But for a synth, what you want to be able to do is control how fast the note starts playing, how loud it stays as you're holding the note, and how long it takes to release as you let go of the note. And so this is called, and can be set with, ADSR, which is Attack, Decay, Sustain, and Release. So we're going to set that now. So Synth Player, and we're going to set ADSR and set a value for each of them. So attack 
is how many seconds from when you start pushing the note until it reaches maximum volume. So we're going to say 0 0.9 seconds to get up to full volume. Decay is how many seconds until it hits the sustain volume. So in this case, we'll say 0 0.2 seconds. And then sustain is what percentage of maximum volume does it keep the note at as you hold it down. So it's between 0 and 1. In this case, we'll do point 0 0.1 to say after it's gotten up to full volume and after 0 0.2 seconds of decaying, it will stay at 10% volume. And then release is how many seconds after you release the note until it goes down to zero volume and is not audible anymore. So we'll just say two seconds for demonstration. So now if I run this and we push the note down, and release it. So you can hear that it took a longer to get up to maximum volume, 0.9 seconds. And then very quickly, it went down to 10% volume and it stayed there while I held the note. And then once I released it, it took about two seconds to release. It goes up and then it drops down to 10% volume and stays there while I'm holding it. And then as I release, it fades out over two seconds. So you can use this to adjust how this sounds. So now if we drop this down to 0.2 seconds and we bring this sustain up to one just so that we want to keep it up there and we drop this released 0.5, so it fades out in 0.5 seconds, we should have a totally different note quality. So this is a lot different. So you can set these to much different values and get very different sounds out of your synth. The last thing I'm going to say for synths is that you can also modulate them, which is to change the frequency or the volume based on a wave or an envelope or uh, a different different modulation of some kind. Uh, and I'm not going to get too far into this again because this isn't the, a synth design. And honestly, because of how robust the synth is within Playdate, you could probably spend an entire one hour video just talking about the synth and you'd still just be scratching the surface about what's possible with this synth player. So for now, instead, what I want to do is I want this synth to vary in volume and go up and down as I'm playing it. And so I'm going to create a low frequency oscillation to do that. So we're going to say, make a new variable. We're going to call it LFO. And it is going to be a pd.sound.lfo new. And now we want to set the rate. So I want LFO set rate. And that's how many times it's going to cycle through in one second. So I'm going to say uh, five times in a second. And so this low frequency oscillation is essentially a waveform that's just going to go up and down. And it's going to default to a uh, sine wave, but we could change it if we wanted with pd.sound. We could put in, let's just put that in here. So now this is going to make an oscillator that's a square wave that repeats five times every second. So now that I've made this, I can apply it to the synth player. So I can say synth player set amplitude mod and pass in the LFO. Let's try this. So if I push this now, You can hear the volume of the synth going up and down, either to maximum or to zero, because it's part of a square. Uh, and it's happening about five times per second. And it still follows the envelope that we set with ADSR for the sync, or for the, for the synth. So if I change this and I change this back to a sine, it should be a little more gradual. A little more, but it's pretty fast. So let's change this down to two, two times per second, so we can hear it a bit better. So now it's varying a little more smoothly, but it's going up and down, and stays with it as it goes out. And if we wanted, instead of doing the amplitude, if we wanted to do the frequency, we could use the function set 
frequency mod. And run it again. And it's changing the frequency. So you can hear the, the frequency going up to a higher pitch and back down to a lower pitch. And still keeping with this ADSR as it goes in and out. So this is a very basic way to modulate it. There's also ways that you can just start at one frequency and go up to a higher frequency or down. You can apply it to a filter. You can set the amplitude of this LFO. You can change how it's triggered. There's all kinds of different ways that you could use this to create potentially different sound effects or music or whatever you wanted to do to create sound within the play date itself. But now we're going to talk about, let's say, let's take out this um, LFO, this modulation, so that we're back to just the regular synth player. And adjust this back to zero so it plays right away. So let's say you had a synth and you wanted to use it to make a sound effect, something like a few nodes put together uh, so that when you unlocked a chest, it played a little, you know, four notes together that made a sound that worked. So we need some way to tell the play date to play multiple notes together. And the way we're going to do that is with a sequence. Uh, and within a sequence, it's going to have a track. So what we want is to create a new track that is a set of four notes with the timing and the notes that we want to play. So let's do that now. So we're going to make a new variable. And we're going to call it, um, let's call it chest open. And it is going to be a pd.sound.track.new. And a track is just a set of notes. And each of the notes is going to have a step, which is the timing of it, the note, which is like uh, the frequency. So we can put in the MIDI note or we can put in the frequency, but like something like this. So essentially a, a sound that it wants to play. And it will have how long that note needs to play for. Uh, and also how hard it's hit, but we're not going to use that for now. So let's say, let's make a little four note track for if a chest opens. So we're going to say chest open and use the function add note. And we're going to make a note. So the first item is the step. So this is the first one that's going to trigger right away. So we're going to use step of one and we're going to play B flat three. And we want that to play for two steps. And you could also put in the velocity. In this case, it's going to be 1, but it'd be a value between 0 and 1. Uh, so let's add four more notes. So we're going to duplicate that with Alt-Shift-Down. And now, if we wanted to play them in sequence, one after the other, evenly spaced, we'd say 1, 2, 3, 4. And this is going to put them one after the other. But let's add a space after the first one. So we're going to say it'll do it step one, and then there'll be a short gap, and this will play at five, and then six, and then seven. And instead of B flat three, we're going to do some other notes. We'll do C four, and we'll do G four, and we'll do B flat four. And each of these is going to play just for one second, or for one step. So now this is a this track is a set of four notes that are spaced out with the first note, a B flat three, playing for two steps, and there's a little gap, and then it's going to play the other three notes quickly in succession. But now we need to add this to a sequence to play. So a sequence is basically just a collection of tracks and it's going to play those. So let's make a new sequence. So we're going to say, call this chess sequence, and it is going to be a new p.sound.sequence.new. And we're going to add this track to it. So chess sequence, add track, and we're going to add chest open. So now when we play this sequence, it should play these four notes together. Uh, and it defaults to a tempo of, I think, one step per second, 
but you can adjust it with chest sequence, set tempo, let's say 10 steps per second to be quite fast. And so to play this, um, we're gonna take the A button that we were using to do the music player before and then replace it. So let's do chest sequence play. And we're gonna have it just trigger and go all the way through. We're not gonna have to hold in order to play it. So if we run this, and I push the A button, nothing happens. And that's because it has this track and it is set to play it, but it doesn't know what to use to play it. It doesn't have an instrument to play. It just says that these are the notes, but it doesn't know what type of wave it should use, uh, what the ADSR should, you, should be. It has no, no information about what kind of sound it should be making with these. And so to change that, we have to attach an instrument to the track. So for our chest open track, we are going to say chest open, set instrument, and we're going to pass in our synth, our synth player. And you could just pass it in like this, uh, but what I have found is that passing in a copy of it is less likely to cause problems. So this function, copy, creates an exact copy of this synth player at the time when you call it and passes it in. So it makes a whole new synth player that's passed in. Uh, and this is mostly to avoid that if you have multiple tracks and you're applying multiple instruments or the same instrument to multiple tracks, only one instrument can be applied to a track at a time. Anyway, so this track now has an instrument, it's gonna use our synth. And so if we run this, we should get something. So let's try. Do this, we push A. There you go, so it plays through. So it does the first note and then there's a short gap and then it plays the next three notes in succession. And it's playing them about 10 cycles per second. So if we slowed this down to five, you get something that's half as fast. And so in this way, you can add several notes together to make a little sound effect or to do a little repeating music section. So if you wanted to do this to actually have the background music of your game, you would need to have a track that has all the notes in it. And so if you do that with this method of putting in the steps and the notes and the length, and whatever, it is going to get extremely tedious, extremely fast if you have more than about eight to 12 notes. And so instead what you can do is import a MIDI, fi MIDI file from something that you've already made. So MIDI is a typical export or an output of any DAW or audio workstation or uh, anything where you've been able to sit down and create the music separately, you should be able to pull out some kind of MIDI file. And so Playdate can import that MIDI file and turn it into multiple tracks. And in a MIDI file, you can have multiple tracks for different instruments. And so you can pull them in and it apply different instruments to different tracks. So let's do that now. So let's create a new variable. We're gonna call it music sequence. And it is going to be a pd.sound.sequence.new. And so before we made a new sequence with no inputs or no arguments, and this time we're going to make it new and we're gonna add MIDI file.mid to initialize it with that. So now as it creates it, it's going to load the tracks in this MIDI file into this music sequence. And it's automatically gonna create a new track for each of the tracks within this file. So now if we were to change this to music sequence and run this, we get nothing. And that's for the same reason that we had before, which is that this music sequence is a sequence of tracks and each of those tracks has no instrument. And so the plated has no idea 
what each of these tracks is supposed to sound like. And this is especially important if one of your tracks is a flute melody and one of them is a snare drum. You don't want those to sound the same, you want them to sound totally different. And so you want a different instrument applied to each of these. So when we import a MIDI file, we then have to extract the tracks, apply an instrument to each of them, and then dump them back into the sequence. So we're going to do that now. So let's make a new track for each of these. So this is a MIDI file that I downloaded from the internet. Uh, it is two tracks. One is a higher melody that plays a couple notes. And the other is this lower section that plays continuous notes. But it's got two separate tracks for two separate instruments. So we want to import those. So let's make a new track. Call it track one, and it's going to be music sequence get track, and we're going to get track at index. And for this MIDI file and for other ones that I've used, for some reason, the track at index one has always been empty. And so if we wanted to get this track one, we'd actually we'd have to actually get the track that's at index two for some reason. And this could be different for different MIDI files, it's just what I've found so far. So track one, we're gonna get track at index two, which is going to go into music sequence and it's gonna find the second track. And then we're gonna have another track, make another new variable, which is track two, and it's going to get the track at track, into at index three from the music sequence. Now we're gonna set the instruments so we'll say track one, set instrument, and we're gonna pass in a copy of our synth player. Again, we're using a copy because if you try to set the synth player to multiple tracks, it's gonna give you an error. So we're gonna, for track two, we also need to set the instrument. And for this one, if we wanted to, we can use a whole new synth, we can say, pd.sound.synth.new and it's going to give a sine wave synth with an ADSR of 0010, something like that. Um, so now we need to, so now we've set these and now we need to put these tracks with instruments back into our music sequence. So we are going to say music sequence set track at index two, and the track we wanna set is track one. So now that'll put that into music sequence as the track. Let's do the same with track two. We'll set it at index three, and we'll put it at that. And there we go. So now this music sequence should have its first track, which is blank, and then the two tracks that we saw on here, except now with instruments applied of a synth player and a new sine wave synth, and we press A button, it should play. So let's try it. And push this. And it runs. And so it has loaded in our MIDI file, and it has taken it and applied an instrument to each of them, and then it's played it back to us with those. And so you can do this with any music file that you've created that you have the MIDI to, or something that you've downloaded and have the MIDI to, where you can put it in and play it, and then you can also set it to loop. So if we say music sequence set loops zero, it can loop forever. So now you've got a way to create music that you don't have to pre-record, you don't have to download, you don't have to save it as Waver MP3. You can have the play date do it. And in this way as well, you can change things around on the fly if you want to change it between levels, if you want to adjust it to whatever the player is doing, you have that freedom and you can adjust it on the go. So that's it for this tutorial. This covers kind of the basics. Each one of these, you could really 
spend hours on and in, in figuring out the the details of and especially the synth is especially powerful but hopefully this has given you an initial idea of how you can include some sound effects and some music in your game and be able to to set it up easily and to trigger it and control it anyway thank you for watching i hope you enjoyed thanks bye